Good afternoon. How are you? So happy that I can come here and uh, join you in worship. Uh, thank you, uh, worship team, for the wonderful uh, songs and choruses. Uh, really bless our heart, right? And uh, thank you, Louis. You are the youngest uh, member of uh, the worship team. Well done. Keep, keep playing, huh? Keep playing. Okay. Thank you, Martin, for uh, reading the scripture uh, for us this afternoon. Uh, be before I preach the sermon, uh, let me ask you a very uh, important, uh, but also, I believe, very personal question. Are you in pain? Do you believe in no pain, no gain? When I was selected with 57 others to attend the Ranger course, which is the toughest course in the army, the instructors told us that they believe in no pain, no gain. So they put us through the toughest physical and mental tests just to prove what they believe. As the course progresses, I saw some ranger trainees actually cry. Big men cry in the barrack and some of them quit. When the course finally ended after eight weeks, only 13 out of 58 graduated. In other words, only less than 25% survive the course. When I step forward to receive the Ranger Tech, I finally understood what it means by no pain, no gain. And why the Ranger Tech means so much to the person who wears it. And the truth is very clear, right? Unless we personally go through the experience of pain, we will not be able to appreciate what we can benefit from pain. Although not all of us will experience high degrees of pain, like in the Ranger course, or for the matter, like the pain that Job is suffering. Pain remains good to all people. Why? Because pain tells us something is wrong with us. For example, chest pain. Chest pain warns us of the potential of a heart attack. So a medical checkup is needed. A medical checkup, medical checkup should be done as early as possible. Ignoring what pain, this chest pain is telling us may lead to more painful consequences. And this is the truth that we are going to learn from Job chapter 36 today. But before that, let us look at the big picture, the big picture of the book of Job. If we look at the book of Job as a drama series, how many of you watch drama series? You're so shy. I know all of you, most of you all watch, right? <laughs> okay, then uh, the, the book of Job will look something like this. Season one. Job chapter 1 to 31, Job and his three friends. Season 2, Job, uh, Job chapter 32 to 37, Job and 
uh, Elihu. And then season 3, Job chapter 38 to 42, is Job and God. Now, so far we have watched eh, the season 1, which ended in a stalemate. The three men counseling team eh, not only failed to help Job uh, to find the answer for his suffering, they also caused Job's faith in God to deteriorate. Job has changed. He has changed from adoring God to accusing God, from proclaiming faith to crying foul, from serving God to sinning against God. It is uh, really the opposite of the Job we know in chapter 1, verse 1, which says that Job was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from, from evil. So before God appears in season 3 to resolve the problem of suffering and wrap up the book of Job, season 2 feature a man called Elihu or Elihu. In Hebrew language, it means he is my God. Elihu is a fearless young man who speak up in defense of God's honor, bringing Job to pay attention to God. So season two is like a bridge for Job to cross to meet God in season three. This is what we have watched so far in season two. Season two has four episodes. The first episode, Job chapter 32 to 33, a timely speech where our pastor uh, preached on this, huh? Pastor Chi Hong. Elihu breaks at the silence and scolded Job and his three friends. For what? For incompetence, for lacking in knowledge, in wisdom. However, this episode one closes with a sense of joy. You know why? Because Elihu talks about God's heartbeat. And then in season two, in epi second episode, Job chapter 34, preached by Elder Gregory, Elihu defends God's justice and called Job a rebel. In verse 37, he said, Job, who adds rebellion to his sin. And then in the third episode last Sunday, huh? Job chapter 35, uh, preached by uh, Brother Ernest, Elihu condemns Job for thoughtlessly offending God with empty words. Now, as we see in the last verse, of chapter 35, verse 16. It says, Job opened his mouth in empty talk. He multiplies words without knowledge. It means that Job is without wisdom or without the true knowledge of God. So as we can see at this point, Job is really in great pain. After counseled by his three friends and even by Elihu, the young man, Job is suffering not only physical pain, but also emotional and spiritual pain. Job is now a man who is old, broke and sick, lying at a corner without friends, without God and without any hope. Now imagine if this is the man this man called Job is your father or your grandfather for the matter. What will you tell him? Well, we see that season two is going to end in disaster. There is a spark of light 
in the last episode. Episode number four. In Job chapter 36 and 37, we see Elihu pick up the topics of God using suffering. Listen, God using suffering as a means of disciplining his children. From the first episode, Job chapter 33, verse 19 to 28, to address Job's pain. Now, this time, Elihu does it in the light of God's wisdom and power of cosmic scale. Elihu is going to show Job how great and how good is the God who is silent all this while. Now, in this fourth uh, and final episode of uh, season two, Elihu begins by persuading Job not to give up, but continue to listen to what more he has to say about God. Before we proceed, let us pause for a while and pray. Let us pray. Huh? Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, uh, we are now coming to the end of uh, the book of Job. Lord, we thank you for giving us uh, the patience and endurance. We pray, dear Lord, that you will also likewise today give us, Lord, the, the attentive ear, open our eyes and ear, Lord, to listen to what you're going to say to us. Lord, we also want to pray for those who are coughing, uh, those who are not well in body, in our midst. Father, uh, I pray the Lord that uh, you will cause, uh, cause them uh, to be well and uh, all of us will be able, Lord, to uh, listen and be attentive, Lord, to the message this afternoon. We pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In verses 2, 3, and 4, Elihu pleaded to Job to be patient in listening to him as he wants to share with him some deeper knowledge of God. We, know, we all know that when a person is in pain, listen to God is not his first instinct. Not the first instinct. Especially for Job, who has been bombarded uh, with cold and harsh theology in the last two episodes chapter 34 and 35. To persuade Job to listen, Elihu emphasizes two things, accuracy and completeness of the knowledge of God. Now, this is especially necessary uh, since Job has been talking foolishly without the knowledge of God. Now, Elihu says in verse 3, he will get his knowledge of God from afar. This may mean getting knowledge of God from many places, traveling to many places, or inspired by God. Now, which means Elihu has diligently and thoroughly studied and tested and proven to be true and accurate of the word of God, or God has actually revealed to him, or both. So in verse 4, some commentator think that Elihu is claiming he has the perfect knowledge of God. In other words, he claimed that he is equal to God. But in this context, it is not. Because in verse number 3, Elihu says he ascribed righteousness to God, his maker. That means Elihu acknowledged that he is a creature of God. He is not equal to God. Elihu is emphasizing that he is not expressing his own opinion, but speaking on behalf of God. Just like what I'm doing. In other words, what Elihu is going to say about God will be true. Perfect and complete, not false. Now, as we see in the following verses, when Elihu 
the justice of God, but also the graciousness of God, which is lacking before that. Elihu is going to give the complete picture of what God is like. The ultimate aim of Elihu in verse 1 to 4 is to tell Job that, hey Job, you ought to listen attentively. This is the word of God. So I hope we have this habit in this worship hall. Whenever we preach the word of God, it is to be treated as the word of God. So the lesson for us is this. God's word must be diligently studied and faithfully communicated and then reverently listened to. Just like what you're doing now. Very good. So when we counsel people in pain, we must present the full picture of God who is both just and merciful. Now to do so, we must spend time, uh, we must spend time and effort to carefully and thoroughly study the word of God. Now I was uh, very encouraged uh, uh, by the more than 30 of us uh, gathered last Sunday uh, in the multi-purpose hall uh, to listen to our Pastor Chi Hong, you know, teaching us uh, about God's big picture. As Christians, we must never think that we already know everything. We must be humble and be diligent in studying the Bible. Cultivate the love for God's word should be our first responsibility because it will strengthen our faith and our relationship with God. And it will also enable us uh, to present accurate and complete truth of God, which will benefit other people. So like Elihu, Elihu we must be brutally honest and sincere in our counsel to people, especially those who are in pain, so that we will not miss the representing God. Here in verses 5 to 21, Elihu tells Job that contrary to what he thinks, that God is distant and God is uncaring. The truth is that God cares. Elihu says, God actually cares and wants to heal his pain. So in verse 5 to 21, Elihu urged Job to listen to God even in his pain. In verse 5 to verse 14, Elihu says that God cares about our pain. In verse 5, Elihu says God is mighty. That was the first word. Mighty. Mighty, in a Hebrew language, it means strong of heart, strong in understanding. God has perfect understanding. He knows everything and he is determined to achieve his divine purposes. God is all-powerful and all-wise, able to accomplish all his purposes. So. That is something that Job must come to take note of it. And in spite of God is so mighty and so wise, so perfect, God has no favorite, Elihu say. He does not despise anyone, whether you are wicked or righteous, whether you are high or low in the society. God is keeping a watchful eyes uh, on all human beings all the time as we see in verses 
6 to 14. Elihu says, God's justice will prevail. He will punish the wicked and he will reward or vindicate the righteous in verse 6. Now, it sounds like retribution theology, but it is not. Huh? It is not. If we look at verses 7 to 14 carefully, God spoke to the righteous in verse 7 to 12. God accords the righteous with high regard and pleased with them, just like God is pleased uh, with the king uh, who rules the nation in righteousness, in verse 7. However, if the righteous are caught in affliction, it is not a punishment to them, but God is using their painful experience to speak to them about their sin, as we see in verse 8 and 9. Let me read to you. Verse number 8, Elihu say, And if they are bound in chains and caught in the courts of affliction, then he declares to them their work. God will declare to them, make them to know their work and their transgressions their sin, that they are behaving arrogantly. Then in verse 10 to 12, Elihu says that if they listen and repent and serve God, they will end their lives well. However, if they refuse to return to serve God, they will die violently in verse 12. They will perish by the sword and end their lives without knowledge, without knowing God's goodness and grace. Here we learn that Elihu is not preaching prosperity gospel. He is honest about the reality of Christian life. Righteous, listen, Christian, believer of Jesus Christ, do suffer. There is no painless Christianity. If people introduce you or preach to you a painless Christianity, that Christianity is pointless. Now, as for the wicked, in verses 13 to 14, Elihu says that they will not cry out to God because they reject God. Since the wicked refuse to listen to God, they forfeit God's protection. In fact, the suffering of the wicked will intensify with their hatred of God. Now, as they continue their wicked way, sooner or later, they will perish. So in summary, for verse 5 to 14, it tells us that God cares for both the wicked and the righteous. Painful experience is God's gracious provision to speak to us about our sins, just like the chest pain that gives us the warning of a potential heart attack. In order to soften, God speaks to us through pain in order to soften our hearts and open our ears. So like Job, we must take time to examine our character and our relationship with God, even in times of pain, because it has the potential to change our lives for the better. Why? Because in verses 15 to 21, Elihu says God wants to heal our pain. Elihu makes it even clearer that God allowed painful experience in the life of the righteous and the wicked so that they can be delivered from their misery. Let's look at 15, verse 15 and 16. He delivers the afflicted by their affliction and opens their year by diverse adversity. He also allured you out of distress 
into a broad place where there was no camp cramping. And what was set, and what was set on your table was full of fatness. What does it mean? God's desire is to use the painful experience of Job to allure or persuade or urge him to acknowledge his sins and repent. God wants to deliver Job from a cramped place, a confined place, to a broad place. Because Job is now suffering in a confined place due to his illness. Job is unable to move freely uh, to other places. And God has prepared for Job, listen, God has prepared for Job a table full of fatness. What does it mean? Fatness usually refer to blessing, right? Full of blessing. In other words, God wants Job to have the freedom of fellowshipping with him and enjoy his full blessing. This is indeed a gracious offering from God. Now, however, Job is warned not to do three things in verses 17 to 21. Warning number one, do not demand justice. Verse 17, but you are full of the judgment on, on the wicked. Judgment and justice seize you. Now, because Job has been accusing God for injustice, and he is indeed in danger of speaking ill of God as a way out of his pain. Warning number two, do not attempt to escape pain. Verses 18 to 20. Beware lest wrath entice you into scoffing, and let not the greatness of the ransom turn you aside. Will your cry for help avail to keep you from distress or all the forces of your strength? Do not long for the night when people vanish in their place. Job is warning, is warned not to be prideful and refuse, the, refuse to repent. The word ransom refers to the price he has to pay for repentance. You know, sometimes pride, you know, our pride, our self-pride, is value higher than anything else. And we become very stubborn. There is also no point, Elihu say, crying in pain. Why? What is the use of crying in pain without repentance? So no matter how loud is your crying, is your complaining, it is in vain. So in verse 20, Job is warned not to take his life. Don't long for the night as an easy way to escape pain. Warning number three, do not turn to evil. Verse 21, take care. Job, do not turn to iniquity. For this you have chosen rather than affliction. What does it mean? Job has been making empty complaints against God instead of enduring the pain. He should stop behaving like unrepentant, wicked men. Keep on sinning against God. Job should choose to endure the suffering instead of offending God. In other words, it is better to bear the pain than to offend God. Why the three warnings? Obviously, Elihu is trying to shut off any thoughts of Job or avoiding God's discipline. Job's prolonged pain is God's disciplining him. God is screaming at Job to stop accusing him 
for being unjust. Accepting God's offer of freedom to live and to serve God is the only correct response, in other words. So if Job listened and accept God's gracious offer of deliverance and return to him, he will benefit he will benefit from this painful episode. Now let me give you an example of God speaking through painful experience in our own Chinese fellowship. In the past two months or so, I have witnessed two Chinese fellowship members who before rejected God in the past. Then they have come to believe in Jesus Christ during their hospitalization. Just like my mom did many years ago. In spite of suffering pain in the hospital, they miraculously, listen, they miraculously confess that they believe in Jesus. Let's give you one example. Last Monday, I visited Mr. Goh, who is uh, Esther Lim's father, after his heart surgery, and I asked him whether he believed in Jesus. You know what he said? I believe already. So to make sure, I explained the gospel to him again. To make sure that he truly believed before praying a thanksgiving prayer with him. And the next day, Mr. Go texted this to tell us that in a special circumstance, he suddenly saw our, our Jesus and then he ended with these two words, in sickness, they turn to trust in God instead of rejecting him. Now, how God actually brought them to have a relationship with him? We don't know. We don't know, but we do know that they have heard the gospel in the past five years. This month marked the fifth year of the Chinese fellowship. We started in 2018. They have been told over and over again at the Chinese fellowship that God loves them unconditionally. God cares for them and God wants them to repent of their sins and serve him. And they did. So in summary for verse 5 to 21, contrary to what Job is thinking, God does care about his pain and wants to heal his pain. Job must re respond positively to the pain allowed by God by returning to God and bless God instead of blaming him. The pain he is suffering is God's instrument to heal his broken relationship with God. Job will not regret if he choose to trust God because the God who allows him to suffer pain is perfectly wise and sovereign. So in the remaining verses, verses 22 to 33, of Job 36, God has the perfect wisdom to teach us and the perfect power to bless and judge. In verses 22 to 25, Elihu says that we can see in human history the perfect wisdom and 
the power of God. Elihu presents three rhetorical questions. In verse 22, he asks, Who is a teacher like God? Answer, no one. Verse 23, Who has prescribed for him his way? That means, how are you going to do it? What is going to do it? No one. Or who can say, hey God, you have done wrong? No one, of course. But in verse 24 to 25, it says, Remember to extol his work, to, of which men have sung. They may have sing praises. All mankind has looked on it. Look at the work of God. Men behold it from afar. So as witnessed by all mankind, God is in control. In spite of all the wars that waged by the kingdom on earth in ages past, God remained God. God in control. And the earth is still being preserved because God is in control. God is in charge. Now this is expressed also by the psalmist in Psalm 46. I think many, we are very familiar with this. Uh, Psalm 46. May God demand that we are calling us to be still and know that he is God in spite of all the trouble that's going on in this world. God not only has the wisdom and strength to rule over the world, he also has the power over the elements of nature. Verses 26 to 33. Elihu shift our attention to God's power over the nature. Our God is the God is the creator God. God can change the water into cloud and make rain and make storm, creates lightning and thunder as he wishes anytime, anywhere. That is what Elihu is saying here. No one can tell him what to do and no one understand how he does it. As we see in verses 26 and 29. Let me read to you. Verse 26, Behold, God is great and we know him not. Verse 29, Can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds, the thunderings? Of course, we don't understand. That means God does it mysteriously and supernaturally. So in verse 31, it tells us that God can use the storm to judge and to bless at the same time. Verse 31 reads, For by this, referring to the rain and the storm, He judges people. You know, when the big flood comes, too much water, many will be destroyed. He gives food in abundance. But on the other hand, water can bring us, can fertilize or can, can irrigate the farmland and bring us much fruit and food. So as God can judge and bless with one thing, we must look at God's working in a correct and wider perspective. Let me give you an example. The rain before the wedding last month at TCEPC. Are you all here? You all here, huh? Okay. Let me ask you, has God ruined the wedding? I, I saw somebody uh, shake uh, her head. So you are agreeing with God. <laughs> no. What we saw is that the church united in love for one another. 
at least in these two areas. The first one is that we saw that the, the guests of Derek and Carissa occupied here, upstairs. And then all the church members actually stayed downstairs and watched the wedding service on the screen. And what happened after the service? The church members put their hands together and cleaned up the mess. They have indeed showed the world that they are the disciple of Jesus Christ. So, tell me, is God wrong to send the rain on that day, 29th of April, just before the wedding? Look at God in the correct perspective. So lesson for us is that we can trust God in all circumstances. We must not think that God is unfair if he does not give us what we want. We should be more concerned of what God wants. Because we simply don't know. We should not think or talk like we know. Even when God is not answering our prayer, we should submit to God's will. You remember Jesus, what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane? Agonizing in pain before he went to the cross. What did he say in his prayer at the end? Not my will, but your will be done. So we can see that in his obedience, our Lord Jesus, in his suffering and through his suffering, has brought blessing to many including all of you and me. So in conclusion, God allows painful experience for our benefits. First, is to reveal our true character. Because we will react and our character will show. Painful experience will also teach us God's character. And finally, painful experience can teach us about faith. Faith involves trusting God even in dark hours, even when we are very painful in our life. So we need God's strength to weather the storms of our lives. Job's pain was teaching him the meaning of trusting God. What is pain teaching you today? What can we do to keep trusting God even in time of pain? I would like to suggest to us today that we all must learn to trust God in all circumstances so that we can live with joy and contentment by saturating our life with the word of God, with spiritual songs, and with prayer. Why I say that? Let me share with you and I will close. Yesterday, my wife and I celebrated our 44th wedding anniversary. As I reflected on our life journey together in the past 44 years, I thank God. I thank God for His presence and power that kept and preserved us in three painful periods of our life. The first is separated from my wife. We were separated for six months because I was sent to Thailand to carry out my military duty. But my wife was expecting our first child. She was two months uh, pregnant. 
And thank God, what actually kept me going was the Bible that I brought along. And I was on time when I finished my duty, military duty and returned to Singapore to receive our firstborn. And second painful experience was the loss of my baby. Seven month old baby boy died through an accident. Nobody's fault. And at the mortuary, I burst out in songs. It just come automatically. What a friend we have in Jesus. That tie me through. And lastly, the third one is leaving my former church to come and serve in TCEPC. How I survived the past 12 years and hand over to Pastor Chi Hong after 12 years is by prayer. So I want to encourage all of us because I know that every one of us is broken. Every family has a problem. But we need God and we need to trust Him. So let us spend some time, just a minute or so, to reflect on this sermon. In your reflection, surrender your pain to God. I do not know what is your pain now, what are you struggling with? And ask God to grant you wisdom and strength to trust His divine power and purpose. He has a purpose for the particular pain that He assigned to you.